Hello and welcome to today's webinar on the Government of India's latest attempt to provide the country with a structured privacy regulation, the Digital Personal Data Protection Bill, uh, which was released on November 18th for public consultation. Comments can be sent by December 17th, which is this coming Saturday, and we are hoping that today's session will help some of you formulate your comments to the government. I'd like to quickly set the context for today's webinar before bringing in my two colleagues, Konishko and Obishek. All three of us are lawyers in explosion. Later in the discussion, we'll be joined by Bibhav Pradhan, who is the Data Privacy Advisor for Hindustan Unilever South Asia, and Mr. Rishi Vyas, the Legal Head for Nayara Energy Limited. We are sure Bibhav and Rishi will provide us extremely valuable industry insight on the bill. As most of you attending this webinar are aware, India does not have a specific law to deal with data privacy, but we do have the Information Technology Act and its associated rules, such as the SPDI rules, which does lay down a fairly detailed structure for how to deal with digital or electronic data as it is called. However, since the Information Technology Act is a different context, it has been the general belief that the separate privacy law is required. The genesis for this can possibly be traced back to the Supreme Court's judgment in the 2017 Puttuswami case, where the right to privacy was declared as a fundamental right. This prompted the government to come up with a previous version of the bill. That version went through several iterations before being withdrawn in August this year, and the current one was presented in November, uh, as earlier mentioned. Uh, we will only touch upon some key concepts that we believe uh, you need to take note of from a business perspective at this stage. Uh, we will definitely have a more detailed session once the next version of the bill is made available by the government. Uh, with that, uh, I'd like to bring in Kanishka, who is going to uh, give us the broad contours of what we are going to discuss today. Over to you, Kanishka. Thank you, Indravi. So, of course, uh, currently how the bill is, it's, it's a very nascent stage and I think, you know, uh, while it is uh, very hard to predict what the final law will look like, but we do have the broad contours in place and the time is opportune for all of us to familiarize our, ourselves with some of the key concepts. So, today we will talk about some of the key concepts. We will discuss uh, what would be considered as personal data. We'll talk about the applicability of the bill, the three main actors of this bill. Uh, which is the data principal, the data fiduciary, the data processor, uh, the rights and obligations of these actors. And then we'll also touch upon concepts like significant data fiduciary, data retention, uh, cross country data transfer and data breach. So one thing for sure, I mean, you know, this bill is much simpler than its previous iterations. So maybe we can start by the definition of uh, personal data. Avishek, maybe you can take that over. Uh, yes, Kanishka. And on that aspect, it's uh, quite interesting the way personal data has been defined. And uh, to read out an interesting snippet uh, for our viewers, it means any data about an individual or in relation to such data. And I'm not so sure what in relation to such individuals would exclude. Um, perhaps we need to take uh, the views of our panelists on this. Yes, but Abhishek, before uh, going to the panelists, maybe uh, a few things that we probably need to look at from this point of view. There is one, of course, the definition in itself, which talks about the fact that it's personal data, uh, which means any data about any individual uh, who is identifiable by or in relation to such data. Now, it's pretty easy to understand what uh, an individual's identifiable data will be. But what is in relation to such data and, and how does one interpret that portion? And obviously, we are going to get uh, more insights from our, uh, from our panelists. But this is something that probably has not been very well uh, you know, written. And maybe uh, once the next version comes out, we will see that there is a little more clarity. Because uh, if you look at the definition of personal data, and we are not going to get into the details of that in the interest of time, uh, in, for example, the previous versions of the data privacy uh, protection bill or uh, in the SPDI rules or the Information Technology Act, it's a lot clearer than what it is uh, mentioned out here. So this will definitely require a little more attention. But the other thing that we probably need to look at is the fact that this current version of the bill has completely done out in a done away with a particular distinction which we have all gotten quite used to, which is uh, a subset of this personal data, which was called the sensitive personal data or information, which is something that is there, for example, in the sensitive personal data or information rules under the current IT Act. And there, 
a subset of this data has been put at a higher a uh, pedestal with a greater duty of care for those who are dealing with that data which would include things like biometric data health records financial records sexual preference and things like that these have been clearly defined as sensitive personal data and the requirements for consent retention and all of this is far more stringent with this with regard to this uh, data and uh, uh, kanishka maybe you will uh, you will agree that 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 has been completely done away with in this in this particular version absolutely i think the of course the the scope or the uh, overall definition has widened the scope of personal data but there is there is clarity that is required on the definition i think it should be rephrased a little which which might because currently it might lead to a lot of confusion yes and especially since uh, without a clear distinction the requirement to you know deal with personal data uh, is all the same so it's all been painted with the same brush which means that irrespective of whether you are receiving somebody's email id which is also a, a data which is ident which which can be identifiable uh, or if you're receiving health records of a person the duty of care has been made the same because there's no distinction which has been made between these different classes of data which definitely is potentially going to be a cause for concern with uh, uh, you know many of our clients and and many other large businesses which are dealing with terabytes of information and have been historically dealing with what is considered sensitive personal data or information uh, with a with a higher duty of care as was mandated so this will be a space which we'll have to look out for uh, but uh, in the interest of time let's move on to the uh, the next uh, you know key concept that you talked about which is the applicable ability of the bill and 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 who it who it is likely to apply to if this current version goes through and maybe abhishek you can introduce that as a thought uh thanks israel and i'd like to add over here that it applies to data principles within the territory of india uh in other words it applies to instances where data or digital personal data is being processed within the territory of india and uh, the, the, such personal data is collected from data principles online and in the event it's collected offline it's subsequently digitized and in that context if i were to refer to something as basic as the name of the bill it clearly applies to personal data which is digit is in digital form only and i think in line with the constructs of the current information technology act and the spdi rules which also applies to data in electronic form and while some of the earlier iterations of the bill accorded protection to personal data in physical format which is uh, the prevalent form of personal or even sensitive personal data say outside the tier 1 cities interestingly enough the present bill clearly seems to have done away with that concept and therefore unless physical personal data is subsequently digitized there's no gov governing this breach of personal data which resides in physical form and this bill also applies to processing of digital personal data outside the territory of india if the processing relates to any profiling or activity of say offering goods or services to data principles or uh, in the territory of india and you know this uh, seems to cast uh, compliance obligations with regard to uh, being within the territory of india as opposed to the requirement of say being an indian citizen so uh, abhishek if i can just come in here a uh, few quick points on this whole aspect of applicability first of all like you you know uh, succinctly pointed out uh, it only deals with digital personal data which uh, in the indian context might not be adequate because uh, if this is a fallout of the fact that right to privacy has been uh, now added as a constitutional fundamental right uh, that right is not restricted only to digital data so uh, you know lot of information in our context uh, a lot of uh, you know financial information uh, even checks uh, as as a mode of uh, you know paying a person are fairly common in india even today and none of that unless it is digitized subsequently will form a part of this so that's the first thing that we need to understand the next thing is that it only deals with personal data of individuals which means that any data received with regard to a company for example 
for example, uh, if you are a B2B, uh, you know, SaaS provider, and if you're re receiving lots of corporate information, financial information of a company, that does not get covered by this bill. And, and probably might still get covered under your confidentiality obligations and things like that, but is not covered by this bill, at least in its current form. The next point, which again, Abhishek, you, you uh, absolutely correctly pointed out, is that it deals with data principles in India, residing in India. It does not deal with Indian citizens, or uh, and it doesn't even say it has to be a permanent residence in India, which means that if a, if a tourist is coming into India or a, if somebody's coming in for business for a few days to India, for the time that they're in India, they, become, they do become a data principle in the context of India. And therefore, uh, whoever is, is accessing their data at that point in time, irrespective of whether that's uh, uh, for a sale within India or, for, for, or, for out, or from outside, all of that will get covered within the ambit of the uh, current version of the bill. And last, of course, like you were pointing out, and, and Kanishko, you and I were having a conversation on this. Uh, this might make it difficult for some of us who have some unique requirements from online, uh, you know, stores outside of India, uh, the Manchester United store in your case, the Liverpool LFC store in my case, we might find it a little more difficult to buy things from these stores. What do you say? Yes, absolutely. I think if I have to buy something from a global website, for any of the brands which are not uh, operating out of India, uh, whether physically or online, I'll definitely have to provide them personal data and, and by which, by the definition of this, uh, I mean, uh, by the definition of personal data, it can be my name, my phone number, my address, which is essential for this purchase. And uh, so they, the brand automatically becomes a data fiduciary and I become the data principal. So, uh, they, and, and, they, and the problem with that is that while in some cases, uh, the, the data principles in India, so lots of Indians might be a big source of business for, for some of these places. And therefore, for them, it might make sense to now put in all the different requirements under the uh, under the, uh, the this version of the bill or whatever is finally passed. But for, uh, you know, people with a slightly unique taste, if they're looking, uh, you know, uh, to buy something from a store where Indians rarely go, uh, they might actually turn them away rather than, uh, you know, setting up those additional standards. And that might not, uh, you know, uh, you know, stand at least people like you and me in very good stead, uh, the, you know, in, in the, in the, at least in the short term. But uh, in the interest of time, I think we've broadly understood the, the applicability of the act. Maybe we, you know, we need to move to the, uh, the, the three act as you call them, who are the key people in this act. And, and I don't know, but th that's something that you will bring up, right, Kanishka? Uh, so for the three actors, uh, of course, you know, we, we, we will discuss the concepts of data principle, data fiduciary, data processor. Maybe Avishek, you can, you can give us the definition and then we'll try and analyze uh, what this means. So uh, Kanishka, as you uh, mentioned, there are three key players under this bill. Uh, there's the data principal, data fiduciary, and the data processor. And uh, when I see data principal, I mean individuals to whom the personal data relates, like you or I or anyone else from the uh, audience in their individual capacity. An interesting point to note here is that while persons have been defined under the bill to include uh, all persons, including individuals and even corporates, uh, but a reading of the definition of the term data principle specifically mentions individuals. So it would only cover individuals and not any corporate data, as uh, Indranil uh, pointed out earlier, which is an electronic form. So that is interesting then so that um, uh, we can get a reasonable amount of assurance to people uh, attending this webinar that if you're dealing with the data of, let's say, business, uh, financial records, uh, they will not even if they are in digital format. Even then, it will not really. Uh, you know, you're right. Uh, it will still not form a part of this. And and that that's something that we uh, uh, people, especially like us, who are dealing with B2B SaaS data, what we need to understand is eventually what will cover that. And we understand that the right to privacy is an individual right, and therefore uh, corporates are anyway probably not covered in that sense. But uh, would it still be governed by our, uh, you know, agreements, or would there be another uh, uh, enactment, or would there be another place through which 
things like this things like you know uh, data which is still in the physical form uh, will get uh, you know protected is something that we'll uh, uh, you know we'll have to look at sorry and i cut you off for you which brings me to the next actor data fiduciary and uh, it would mean an entity which determines the purpose and uh, means of processing the personal data and the use of the term fiduciary immediately casts an added duty of care on those whom we entrust our, uh, with our data and the fiduciary being in most instances with whom personal data might primarily be shared with primary obligation with regards to protection of uh, the personal data rests on the data fiduciary and the third player data processor is uh, the party who processes the personal data of an individual on behalf of the data fiduciary on the basis of the data fiduciary's instructions and it could be a data cloud service provider or even software analytics company as you were mentioning and in some instances it's quite possible that organizations could end up being both the data fiduciary and the data processor for some or all of the personal data that they are processing and abhishek if i may come in here for a minute uh, i think uh, the, the construct of this act gives us a clear understanding that the the main obligations are really cast on the data fiduciary so even if you are then using a like you mentioned an analytic software for some part of what you do or if you uh, if the data fiduciary is uploading that information onto a cloud the fundamental obligation remains with the data fiduciary so uh, i think anybody who is uh, you know in the audience today should keep that in mind that uh, merely because you have uh, by contract uh, subsequently shared that data with a data processor uh, does not take away any of your obligations with regard to that data and that is something that we uh, that we need to clearly explain to our audience and probably now is a good time to go into therefore the discussion around uh, the key obligations and the key rights of the the data fiduciary and the data principal uh, so uh, you know if we can just move to that part of the conversation uh, because we are i think uh, we need to be sensitive to the fact that we also have the guests waiting so we need to discuss this and then move on to uh, the panel discussion sure indra i think uh, let's talk about the most important obligations of these three players and we'll we'll start off with the data fiduciary who has the most important obligation in the bill as well so they are now required to go ahead and send a notice to the data principals it must be an itemized notice uh, which definitely is defined as a list of individual items and it should contain data which is uh, collected and also the purpose for processing such personal data and kunishko if i might stop you here uh, so this definitely ups the game from the data fiduciary's perspective because uh, to be able to provide an itemized notice what we need to understand is uh, that first of all what needs to be mentioned in the notice are all the different types of data that is potentially being collected for an individual by a data fiduciary so if you are collecting uh, email id mobile number address and potentially let's say uh, you know some other financial record like your credit card number each of these have to be separately mentioned as things that are being collected similarly for every one of this you need to also mention the purpose for collecting and that has to be clearly mentioned it cannot be just uh, something as uh, you know broad as you know uh, doing a analysis or or things like that it has to be more specific and if you therefore have different classes of people for whom you are collecting different types of data and for different purposes you cannot even just have a single notice which you put up on your website and ask everybody to go through you will have to think about these different classes of people differently and provide different types of notice for each one of them so that is that is the first thing that we need to realize that it it has to really be a uh, you know to that extent very very specific the other interesting thing is that this is not just restricted to data going forward if the current version of the bill is what is passed then even for data that you have collected historically you will have to provide now an itemized notice which would mean that for social media companies which have been in you know a business for maybe 10 years 15 years they will have to also provide a notice an itemized notice as you rightly pointed out for that period as well for every one of the people who were a part of this uh, site before this bill came into play and that might that obligation will make it rather onerous and rather difficult to follow and and uh, you know i don't know what your thoughts on that is kanishko 
Absolutely, and you know, even if consent has been obtained prior prior to uh, the enactment of this bill, a notice is still be uh, still be required to send. So definitely a humongous task. Additionally, I think data fiduciaries also have to go ahead and provide the option, uh, you know, for the data principals to access these information in English and any language uh, mentioned in the H schedule. Again, you, you considering the number of languages and for for a, a higher data set, it becomes a humongous task. Right, and then of course uh, it doesn't just stop there. Uh, it it also then has to be uh, uh, an informed consent, right? I mean, it's not just you send the notice and people click. You also have to seek consent once you've provided the itemized notice. Absolutely. If if you look, if you look at the definition of consent, other than it being uh, you know freely given or specific informed, it specifically says clear affirmative action which which signifies uh, agreement to the processing of the personal data for specified uh, purpose so clear and affirmative action uh, is is being stressed so it's just i mean you know the normal consent or the notices that we receive on websites where we can just read through will probably not do of course clear affirmative action something what will definitely not work is i agree to terms and conditions that, that that's correct. Maybe we'll have to understand from uh, you know our IT colleagues what will uh, be an alternative and what will count as a clear and affirmative action. But that that in my belief as well should not do. So because it says clear and affirmative action, which signifies agreement to the processing of personal data for the specific purpose. So, right. and and that is where that language piece that you mentioned. Uh, becomes so relevant. So if you're, if you're, uh, uh, you know, if your uh, potential users are not uh, necessarily conversant with any one or two languages, they should at this point be immediately available to, to switch to another language right. and the terms and conditions need to be then visible to them in a manner where they can understand it in that local language. And, and, and that makes this consent uh, a far more higher level of consent than that was what was required, say, for example, under the current Information Technology Act and the SPDI rules. Uh, but probably what will provide some level of comfort to uh, businesses dealing with large volumes of personal data uh, is the concept of deemed consent, right, Kanishka? Absolutely, I think deemed consent, uh, deemed consent here, um, you know, is is you know where collection or processing of the data is necessary, voluntarily or reasonably expected. Um, you know, you can expect that uh, the consent or the notice is not required, so the consent shall be deemed to have been obtained. So, the, which which is a you know a concept which which is brought in by this bill. And uh, so, which is interesting because the purpose of processing the data then for deemed content, uh, consent is not required to be explicitly mentioned. So as a data principle, I wouldn't know uh, why my data has been collected if it is deemed uh, to be obtained and wherever it is necessary. I will slightly differ from uh, you on this, Kanishko. I don't think uh, that is the intent of the bill. And I know that the language uh, requires some more tightening. What I think the intent of the bill is, is that, you know, if you are, first of all, seeking consent and mentioning certain purposes, anything else which logically follows from that will get covered under deemed consent. That is one. Then that there are certain types of relationships where by virtue of you subscribing to certain things, uh, you know, providing certain types of information, the assumption can be made or as is mentioned in the bill, reasonably expected to, may, uh, to be made is that you are consenting to that information being used. For example, if you're providing your credit card details, uh, uh, knowing fully well that it is a site where payments are made from time to time, the assumption is that you're consenting to that payment being, you know, you, you making that payment at, at defined period, uh, periodicities or for certain types of transaction. And of course, and something which is very specifically mentioned under the provision of the deep consent is that there are certain types of relationships, for example, the employer employee relationship, which has been specifically referred to in the bill, where by virtue of you seeking employment with an employer, 
the assumption is that you are agreeing to provide some of your records to the uh, to, uh, to the employer for example your biometrics uh, for for the purposes of uh, say you know walking into the office facial id things like that it does not mean and that is where we need to be clear and explain to our uh, audience that the deemed consent in any shape or form takes away from your obligations as a data fiduciary all it means is, you, is that you do not need to separately seek consent the consent can be deemed to have been granted but once that has been deemed your obligations with regard to that data with regard to that data remains exactly the same and that's something that we probably need to uh, bring in uh, kanishka absolutely and i think you know uh, especially with uh, the employee personal data that will come across as a positive news for the uh, employers at least not so much for the employees though <laughs> um okay so in in the interest of time maybe we'll we'll move on to the next concept which is uh, the significant data fiduciary so uh, we we can consider this as the fourth player uh, of the bill uh, so the fourth player can can potentially become a key actor i mean at this moment we don't know because it's not very clearly mentioned uh, what uh, who can who will be a significant data fiduciary but if if they if you are you know and and the reason the why i'm saying that is it it's uh, dependent on the volume of data and the sensitivity of the data being processed broadly and a few other things and at this moment the uh, the government has not really clarified what that volume will be or what the uh, what will be considered to be uh, sensitive but once they do uh, we expect many of the larger businesses in this country to fall within the definition of significant data fiduciary which if i am not mistaken kanishka then casts uh, a number of different obligations on them yes yes obligations like uh, appointing or you know designating a data protection officer um uh, independent data auditor and also undertaking periodic audits including the data protection impact assessment uh, right is it, is it too early to presume that maybe e-commerce uh, entities or social media companies will uh, probably come within the ambit of i'm fairly sure that they will and i am fairly sure that uh, as we move in you know uh, for further iteration and sub, you know subsequent versions of this bill uh, more clearer understanding of who will be a part of that that data set of significant data fiduciaries and how you know this whole audit etc need to happen which is still uh, you know not completely fleshed out in the current version will have a you know a much clearer understanding and you know with that i am assuming that something which is not there currently very again not clearly uh, explained currently which is the concept of uh, data localization uh, and i know that there has been a fair amount of uh, uh, you know back and forth and i've seen some media reports which actually say that uh, data localization has been done away with which is not necessarily the case and if you go to the next slide we'll see that uh, you know as a matter of fact there are some you know nuances that need to be understood that you know the current version of the bill says that data and just to clarify when we were discussing data data localization in the context of the the last bill uh, we were looking at it more from the point of view of uh, certain types of data mostly sensitive data critical data which needed to be uh, you know protected in a certain manner but once we move to the next slide we'll see that now that requirement has completely gone away uh, you know it is all sorts of personal data and it says that the personal data will not be which cannot be sent outside except to notified countries or territories and that notification will come from the central government which essentially means that at this moment sitting where we are without a single country having been notified or a single territory having been notified no personal data can travel outside of india so for cross border data transfer uh, while there is no specific concept of data localization uh, as it was there earlier we believe that unless we know that list of countries it is very difficult to at this moment predict whether the current uh, version of the bill is actually going to be uh, easier to comply with from a data transfer perspective or actually the previous version which were, which had far more greater detail on what could or could not be transferred and to whom uh, which which version is better i think is a little uh, uh, a little early to say uh, 
uh, and uh, uh, you know amongst the other key concepts of course is the concept of data breach which we might may want to quickly touch upon and i do realize that uh, we are we are running short of time uh, in real i'd also like to briefly touch upon the concept of data retention requirement over here um, that the draft bill proposes that organizations which are collecting personal data may not retain the data beyond the purpose for which uh, it was initially collected and uh, this may require organizations to revisit their data retention policies and implement requisite changes to organize uh, a periodic review for user data uh, in order to sync it with the 2022 bill once it is notified and there are other laws as well um, such as say the certain guidelines and kyc guidelines for instance uh, which mandate retention of user data for up to 5 years from the cancellation or withdrawal of registration and uh, this may lead to a, a certain amount of conflict and understanding and i i honestly think that scope for for the clarity on this potential issue and uh, maybe put up as one of the comments uh, or questions to the ministry which brings me uh, to the concept of data breach uh, and the 2022 bill prescribes the requirement uh, for organizations to adopt reasonable safeguards to prevent personal data breaches and in case of such breaches what data fiduciaries are required to do is report the breach to the data protection board of india and all the affected data principles uh, uh, quite an onerous obligation uh, i should say and failure to notify the authority or data pr um, uh, principles uh, may attract a very very steep penalty and before and we move to that penalty abhishek just uh, to explain uh, to the uh, to the audience that we already have uh, a mandate under the recently published certain guidelines to report a data breach within 6 hours now there is now a, a fresh mandate uh, if this bill gets passed in its current form uh, to report the same data breach to the data protection board the number of hours is not laid down yet so this will add to the obligation the other piece that i quickly wanted to touch upon abhishek before we move into the the penalty portion which i know is 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 quite a mind boggling number uh, at, at least in some of the cases is the fact that these reasonable safeguards which has been mentioned here found a reference even earlier in the for example in the current version of the spdi rules but right. there it has also been clarified that uh, iso iec 27001 certification will be considered to be having taken reasonable safe safeguard or re reasonable practices and procedures as it is called in that uh, in the current version of the spdi rules here it is not clearly mentioned which suggests that there is a possibility that there will be some other standards laid down though we are anticipating it will probably at least in the short and medium term continue to be the iso iec guidelines uh, in the interest of time abhishek maybe we can quickly go to the i think equivalent uh, security standards are prescribed uh, which standards are required to be followed by companies to be able to claim safe harbor in the event of a data breach is something which might need to be discussed in greater detail right um, if you want to just quickly touch upon the penalties uh, in the next slide uh, abhishek because the numbers yeah. are quite uh, significant yes uh, there's a lot of buzz around penalties being decriminalized uh, however heard the amounts have been significantly raised so there could be a penal consequence of 250 crores for failure to take reasonable security safeguards now and in the event of uh, such a breach failure to notify the the board could attract a penalty of upwards of 200 crore as penal consequence and small and medium enterprise uh, who are mostly i think uh, information technology companies or ids companies might uh, might struggle to uh, you know uh, cope up with uh, that kind of penalty in in the the, these penalty numbers uh, even for a company like explosion is extremely scary and unless uh, clear parameters are laid down on what kind of action would have led to uh, you know uh, up to a 250 crores so unless we know when it will be 2 when it will be 50 and when it will be 250 uh, you will live under a, a a constant fear of of doing business as a small and medium enterprise of having uh, you know a potential very high penalties uh, in the interest of time we will uh, we will stop this discussion uh, between the three of us here and uh, bring in uh, uh, the two people who I'm sure uh, everybody has been waiting to uh, hear for the last almost half an hour, uh, which are uh, Rishi and Bivav. 
uh, two experts in the area of uh, data privacy who have uh, you know had the opportunity of uh, reviewing this and the previous version of the bill as well as of course uh, are constantly working with the current uh, IT Act and SPDI rules so without further ado we are going to move into the session with the speakers so uh, thank you uh, Bivav, thank you Rishi for taking the time out and joining us today. Uh, we do realize that uh, it must be a very, very busy time for you and both of you are also experts in the area of privacy. So I'm sure your views are being sought by your organization and elsewhere. So thank you very much for your time. Uh, if I can start with you Rishi, uh, essentially at the highest level, what are your initial thoughts on this bill? I'm sure you've, you've gone through it as well as the previous versions. What are your initial thoughts on this bill? So I think uh, we might have uh, lost Rishi for a minute. So I'll, if I can, uh, uh, while he comes back, if I can ask you the same question, Beba, because I have anyway planned to come to you with the same question. So what, what, what are your uh, preliminary thoughts on this bill? Uh, thank you. Thanks, Indranil. Thanks to the Explosion team for inviting me to the panel. Uh, on the bill, I think I we've heard, uh, we've uh, read a lot in the media as, as well as elsewhere that the polarizing opinion, mixed feelings about the bill. Uh, from an industry perspective, I think it's a welcome change. Uh, and I think uh, there are two reasons for it, uh, which I believe that the simplification of the bill uh, warranted. Uh, uh, one is the technology ev evolution is quite dynamic. Um, and because of that, I think having specificities, too many specificities is detrimental uh, in, in the Indian context where we are still evolving understanding and ex uh, trying to um, understand the obligations uh, that would come about as well as uh, the data principles being aware of uh, privacy as a right. So I think that is one. The second is with respect to the bill having been under discussion for ages, we all have been part of those discussions across forums. And we've, I, I think that having a perfect bill um, is not possible in this case. I think we'll, it, it's, it's a uh, journey that we'll have to take and evolve. If you take the example for Europe also, the GDPR came into being in 2016, but they were already, there were legislations across Europe on data protection, uh, may not have been enforced as rigorously as GDPR, but they did understand what information security, data protection, personal data protection, uh, entailed. Uh, in a country like India, I think baby steps is what we require. Definitely the current bill, oh, sorry, the current laws don't suffice. But this one in a simplified format does cover the larger principles of privacy. Definitely there is some gaps and it can be plugged in. But I think as a starting point, if we have a law in place and enforcement starts, we will evolve. We will start evolving uh, the law with stakeholder consultation across industries, uh, privacy rights activists, etc. But I think the starting point is what we have waited too long for a perfect bill to come about. And I think this is the right simplified bill that can start the journey with evolution happening uh, after that. Excellent. And I'm not sure whether Rishi, are you back with us? Because if you are... I would like to ask you the same question. Yeah, Rishi, uh, I am there. I can uh, hear you. Yeah. Okay. So Rishi, if I can ask you the same question, which I was asking Bibav, and then I'll quickly want to come back to Bibav on one or two of the points that he mentioned. And that is at, a, at the highest level, what is your initial reaction to this bill, Rishi? What, what, what are your thoughts on this bill? Are you, are you, uh, you know, if I can broadly say happy, sad, uh, neutral, especially when you compare it with the previous versions? No, I am. I am happy that uh, you know. Of course, it's a move in the right direction, and you know, after a lot of iterations, now what has come out, uh, you know, carries all those uh, you know uh, comments and experiences which they have received, uh, maybe from the local organizations and foreign parties. Uh, you know, a, a multiple stakeholder consultation has gone into it. So, so, so you know, to that extent, you know, yes, the bill is now much more simple and clear. You know, there are no overlapping kind of concepts or definitions, you know, less onerous, so to say, uh, when you say digital. So now, you know, the scope is, you know, quite clear that what exactly it is going to cover. So, so, you know, from that point of view, I see it as a, as a right bill or maybe a bill which can, you know, go through, uh, you know, within, within, you know, kind of a reasonable period of time. 
Sure. So, and 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 I'm actually wanting to ask both of you uh, a little more on that. So, I know that I'm sure you are all, you know, sending your comments to industry bodies. Uh, what is your expectation as as businesses who have been waiting, uh, itching for a, a a structured law for a while? What are your expectations of the government? How soon would you uh, hope that your comments are considered and a final version is tabled before the parliament? If I can start with uh, you, Rishi, or Biva, whichever way you want to go. So, yeah, means uh, I can go first. So, uh, yeah, means the expectation is that since already a lot of time has been spent on, uh, you know, the previous versions and, uh, you know, now it is the time that in case if we want to move to the next regime of, uh, you know, compliance or particularly in uh, data protection, uh, personal data protection then yeah it should go quickly maybe uh, not in if not in winter session maybe in the budget session you no know, it should be placed before the parliament and maybe by end of this financial year we can see the bill coming out with president's assent so that would be my expectation in terms of uh, you know the, the clarity of course you know a lot of uh, the uh, yet to be rolled out in the form of rules and regulations codes standards etc which are going to be issued by the board the proposed board data protection board uh, so yeah, that remains to be seen. So, but yeah, means the expectation would be that ki the the provision should be you know uh, not in the sense they should not be onerous. Let's say you know a lot of liability comes into in terms of data processors, you know being a listed entity. If you have got you know share transfer agents or your third party agents who are processing your lot of data. So you know and then they can be you know further sub parties in that change. So there should be some kind of a protection given to data fiduciaries. In, in terms of any data breach at any of these you know uh, weaker links in the in the chain i would say so that would be a larger expectation second you know the compliance uh, of course the data should be protected but uh, without uh, you know increasing the burden of compliance too much you know it should be kind of commensurate or reasonable to the to that extent so and that uh, you know, larger two ex uh, expectations from the bill sure and rishi will come back to you on the compliance aspects but before that Biba, if i can uh, you know absolutely ask you i think I would partly, I, I would agree with Rishi when he says that there's a lot uh, uh, that would come about for after this uh, legislation. Therefore, uh, I'm expecting the bill to come about before the first half. I'm being a little optimistic. Uh, uh, also, having uh, the bill having been pushed a lot, uh, so I'm, I'm giving the benefit of doubt that okay, it may take longer than uh, the financial year, uh, ending of the financial year. So, but, but before the half, uh, I think they need to come out of this bill because I think there's a journey ahead, which is a more complex one. Um, the uh, whether it is establishing a data protection board which understands technology as well as how to practically implement it because when when we do get into the point points i would want to highlight the aspect that uh, to have a good enforcement and regulatory regime the regulator in this case well it's involving complex technology infrastructure processing etc which no one better than the explosion team would understand uh, that that journey is to be dealt with apart from the rules codes of practices guidances and that would take some time and to start with that journey we need a legislative framework in place so i'm hoping that the government does uh, recognize the uh, the need for it uh, having it being discussed since 2018 and i think uh, ha the later half of the of 2023 sorry the first half of 2023 is where when i'm expecting the bill to see the light of day sure and uh, so Abhishek, I know that uh, as one of our key compliance specialists, you are somebody who probably is more interested in knowing about that part. So over to you if you have a question to the panel. Uh, uh, thanks, Anjanil, which uh, brings me to the second question for our panelists. Um, uh, from purely a compliance perspective, uh, what do you think organizations now need to consider doing differently if, say, the 2022 version of the bill is enacted in its current form, um, as opposed to the current requires of the Information Technology Act and the Allied Rules? So, uh, you know, uh, my view, you know, first of all, you need to do a stock take in case if you are an entity who is going to be covered for the first time under such kind of a regime, personal data protection. Uh, uh, you're, you're not covered under GDPR or any other, uh, you know, data protection uh, laws. So, you know, first you need to do a stock take as to, you know, what all personal data uh, is being collected by various departments, you know, who are interfaced with uh, external agencies or, you know, your customers, consumers, etc. 
so first of all you need to do that then you know you know you need to go by the principles you know there are principles enumerated in the in the uh, bill that you know you, your your limitation should be coterminous uh, your storage should be coterminous with the purpose and things like that so you need to draw down exactly as to where you stand today in terms of whatever personal data you have collected so far because the bill carries a bit of retrospective effect as well you need to provide notice to all those people whose data reside in your system today so first you know the that stock taking is compulsory then second is you need to also look into your kyc practices that you know going forward uh, collecting too much of personal data which may or may not be required in 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 you know in actual terms you know that you may need to rethink or redesign your data collection practices or kyc documents or you know things like that so that has to be taken in account and third from an it perspective you know of course the entire you know it part goes into it but the most critical i see is you know how do you going to manage with the withdrawal and deletion of data you know you, there can be means and ways of collecting you know uh, providing notices and getting the consents but then what do you do when the uh, consent is withdrawn or you know the data is required to be deleted because of the any of the reasons which are mentioned in the bill so from that point of view you know i see a, a, a bit of a compliance thing coming into the this bill sure and we were maybe you know in continuation to vishik's <coughs> question if i can specifically uh, you know talk about the obligations like you know sending out a notice or you know obtaining consent and then maybe you know deem consent as a concept as well uh, how do you think it pans out you know most of our clients are data fiduciaries including probably us how do you think it pans out will it be you know a humongous task so i think the compliance bit i think one of the things that i have learned and unilever has been on this journey since prior to the gdpr having had that association with a parent company in uk we had those learnings from the gdpr uh, and as india uh, as an indian organization also one of the uh, amazing things our senior management has agreed to do was to comply with privacy principles under the pdp bill before hand itself even it became the law just to ensure that there's no future disruption so we've been on this journey for the last couple of years where we've and and i think rishi has already uh, covered points on what an organization should do so i'll not delve too much but i think when when we went on that journey one of the things that we realized that, that there are these legal compliances arising out of the bill but the biggest problem is stock taking as rishi mentioned having an understanding of the te technology infrastructure and processes uh, in the organization and it is humongous uh, it's 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 as complex as it can get it's as ad hoc as dynamic it can get and therefore i think one of the biggest uh, uh, work stream that any organization would have is to get a hold not only stock taking but to harmonize and standardize these um, just to give an example when it comes to uh, before we get into notices and all for example grievance redress or ds uh, dsars as it's called in uh, under gdpr to comply with that and and we have started doing so even if the law doesn't require we we do take requests from our uh, consumers employees etc is to figure out where and where the data is residing whether it's residing in one database or across three third party platforms having that connect having that technology infrastructure which can easily give me a data lineage data uh, data identification across those platforms is very important because currently when we started with a journey it was manual and we have figured out ways to actually uh, uh, standardize these processes i think that's where the work comes about now when it comes to notices etc i think it's fairly simple mm, um the idea is to become transparent uh, the law does speak about and and i think they've simplified the requirement of notice which is a great thing because one of the things that i had a problem with the privacy notice earlier is complexity and as individuals i being a lawyer i hardly read privacy notices all the time through and through all the documents the only thing that we read is the purpose maybe and the kind of data that has been collected uh if you see the itemized bill had security protocols who the data processors is etc when the law provides 
liability on the data fiduciary there's no need to provide data processors which keep changing for an organization you may have aws tomorrow serving you azure serving you the other day and you can't change those processors every time in a notice so therefore they've simplified it i don't think so notice would be a problem you can definitely and with the technology um, available i think having the notice on website sending it through messages etc are all possible it will definitely have incremental cost to it because now when you do take data for direct marketing etc you'll have it uh one of the things that we will still struggle with is the concept of consent and deemed consent i think that needs a little bit clarity from the data protection board uh what kind of consent is possible do i need to take explicit consent because the way gdpr defines consent it's a little confusing for me also between explicit and uh the normal consent and the gdpr it's as exhaustive and as um, uh, rigorous that i feel an explicit consent would be while ico in the uk has tried to differentiate so i don't think so from a consent and Uh, notice point of view it's too uh, difficult for the organization i'm more worried on the other aspects on security having accountability to the uh, data and being able to go back to your uh, data principles and state that this is the data i have with confidence that i don't have anything on kanish apart from the phone number and this thing i don't i have not profiled you etc those kind of things standardizing having a consumer or customer identification database with uh, with insights being in one platform rather than across different brands so those are things i think would be more uh, onerous and that's where i think organization should uh, focus the other thing i just wanted to add on to rishi's point is that there are two things that you necessarily have to do upskilling as lawyers also it took a long time for us to understand because when you have to practically try to implement the legislation uh, understanding of the facts or uh, the context is very important and that upskilling is required for our lawyers um, the upskilling is required for data governance teams or data security most of the organizations bigger ones at least will have info secu- information security teams may not be data governance while we we've already started that journey and we have data governance teams in india itself but i think that's having the right team in frame because a lawyer cannot implement I, i can guarantee you that for any organization a lawyer will not be able to implement these compliances single handedly then they will need the support of technical expertise to tell you that okay an encryption 128 bit encryption is better than a uh, uh, 64 or 256 is what is required in this case uh, maybe in terms of processes so i think a team and lastly i think one of the things that we focused heavily on in the last 2 3 years as an organization is building awareness among employees because of the expanse of data processing and the digital environment that we operate in today uh, one of the things is that every brand manager is collecting data for their campaign um, and using and and we can't make have a gatekeeping exercise because it will be inefficient so therefore basic principles the way i i think the journey will be very similar to competition law you'll have to train lawyers now uh, train business managers leaders and all the way they say that oh i cannot take commercially sensitive information now let's talk to legal first i think that's what we are trying to do we are training our information te- security team data governance team brand managers employees hr people over the last 3 years to tell them that there is law coming give them the basic principles around it so that they are aware that before they do something wherever there is confusion if they are not clear to come to legal so that they can consult uh, there are other things that we as an organization doing but i think the question i think does not demand it so i'll stop here sure no so thank you thank you uh, rishi and vivab that i think uh, that that gives a very clear perspective on uh, the job at hand while we wait for revised versions of the bill to come in uh, one question i had and and either of you vivab uh, if you want to uh, the bill has completely done away with the distinction between different types of personal data right it's it's now just one thing so uh, whether it's financial records health records or email id uh, as long as it helps you identify the duty of care uh, unless it it gets further clarified later seems to be the same how does that impact an organization like yours which is collecting data at such huge scale uh, you know currently i'm sure you, you you made that distinction when you were looking at data and dealing with it in terms of consent etc how how will how will this change things for you for unilever as an organization uh, one of the things that governs us is not only the uh, law of the land uh, there are certain principles that we've um, ethical codes of conduct that governs us and uh, just for everyone's information i think unilever has 
personal data protection and privacy as a core principle within the code of business principles that it operates in. Uh, so the importance, it treats it as, as a human right. So when it comes to sensitive personal data, uh, we are conscious. I, I'm, I'm not too clear on why it was removed uh, because there was a need to distinguish while critical personal data was something that I was not comfortable with because uh, Justice Sri Krishna had not defined it. And uh, definitions coming from uh, the um, subsequently would have been a concern for the industry so that's something that is uh, that's definitely uh, great but sensitive personal data the removal of some of it from the bill is something that is surprising uh, but it's definitely welcome as an industry i think we can get into the journey later on when we realize it but as unilever we will still distinguish it we we have this policy of not collecting sensitive personal data unless necessary we don't operate like a bank or a hospital which requires sensitive personal data as such. We're a consumer products company. Um, there's limited need, while from an employment law perspective, employment compliance perspective, it's required. So we will still balance it out just because the distinction has been done away with uh, lesser compliance for uh, sensitive personal data does not mean more collection. Uh, well, we still will go by the data minimization principle, even if it's explicitly removed from it and uh, not talked about in the current bill. So nothing much changes for us as an organization. One of the things that I think the industry would be happy, or at least as an organization, we, we were happy when we saw not the removal as such, but in the deemed consent, employment usage of the personal data for employment has been completely done away from a consent requirement. Now, earlier, if you remember, the bill had a problem that sensitive, sensitive personal data still required explicit consent. Mm -hmm. And in an employment perspective, most of the things that you collect is sensitive. And it was really annoying trying to take explicit consent from employees every time uh, when the service that was being provided was for the benefit of the employees. So that is the perspective that I'm coming on that uh, it's, it's fairly uh, reasonable from an industry compliance perspective. But from a removal of the distinction, that's something that I'm not clear as to why, because there needs to be a high degree of protection that is required for special categories of sensitive personal data. Sure. And, uh, you know, I know that we are uh, towards the end of our time, but Rishi, I have a question for you. Uh, there has been this discussion about where we, this bill stands on the whole is aspect of data localization. Uh, you know, uh, while there have been some reports which suggest that it's been taken away, uh, our reading suggests that it's not completely gone. Instead, now there is a list of countries or, or territories which will be notified by the government. And at least we don't know which, which those will be. So, as on today, we are not sure. What is your take on this? Is it really, Rishi, to start with you and maybe Bevav, if you, if you want to uh, jump in as well, uh, your take on the whole data localization principle as it stands in the current bill? Uh, Rishi, are you with us? Okay, so uh, probably Rishi, I'll, not hear us. Yeah, so if you, I Bevar, can take it uh, until uh, Rishi joins it. Uh, from a Definitely, I think they've gone, moved away from the hard localization aspect of the previous bill where mirroring of sensitive personal data and prohibition of critical personal data is done away with. Um, uh, one thing that's definitely welcome, I think uh, some of us did not feel that it would be a big compliance cost to it uh, um, because availability was not a problem. I think the uh, government was going to take care of these server requirements, etc. So we didn't think too much. I think we thought that it uh, it may not hamper the operation to a great extent except compliance costs. But I do understand the industry. There are not but there are organizations which would be bearing a lot of cost and arising out of that. That has been done away and it's welcome. But one of the things the government has missed, and it's a very crucial part of this uh, 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 bill, is providing, as you rightly mentioned, that there are specific countries that will be notified. Now, if you see legislations elsewhere, it provides a mechanism of transfer, cross-border transfer to countries which do not feature in this adequacy. It's, it's something very similar to the adequacy pro provision under GDPR. Yes. Now, there may be 20 countries and these 20 countries may be enlisted because of reciprocity of uh, 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 between the countries in terms of cross-border transfer, political relationship, and so on and so forth. So not uh, all 100 plus countries would uh, right. feature in it. And therefore, in a global uh, op world in which organization operate, it'll be very difficult. I don't think so. Organization go and suddenly say that I'm sending the data to XYZ country. Now, please, can you include it in the uh, bill? I don't think so that will happen because it's a, it'll be a quite a tedious and onerous process. So yeah. I think the government should definitely introduce the concept of standard contractual clauses, intergroup schemes, binding corporate rules for right. enabling that because I would see that 
tomorrow a rule cannot bring it if the uh, main act does not have a provision for and is only accounting for notified countries transfer so that is a very is a major concern that i see and that is something that the government should address in the current bill yeah. so rishi i think is back i'll just ask rishi one last question before we uh, you know open the house for a few questions from the audience and that is uh, rishi what is your take on this whole uh, aspect of penalty where uh, while uh, you know uh, imprisonment has been taken away and on one hand the, the the numbers from especially organizations are scale and size of 250 crores and things like that uh, seem quite a bit scary what what is your take on 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 the on the penalties that have been listed in the uh, in the bill yeah so i think government's larger agenda has been to decriminalize you know lot of uh, legislative provisions so in that line of action yes they have done away with the you know imprisonment uh, uh, you know kind of a, a content in that uh, imp- uh, this penalty provisions uh, so yeah from a penalty amount point of view yes it is humongous no, but yes it is it is the need of the art that is re- okay we we probably have lost rishi again and and our apologies that uh, you know uh, we we are, we are not being able to hear him fully uh, i think uh, in the interest of time uh, i'd like to thank uh, both bevav and rishi for the time that they've given us and for their incredible insight from a business perspective which sitting uh, you know in our outsiders point of view we don't necessarily bring to the table so really really appreciate the time that both of you have given us uh, with this and i know that we are uh, very short of time from the webinar perspective but uh, we will take a few questions from the audience and then uh, we'll try and get you the responses to the rest Uh, over the next few days so thank you so much for your time rishi thank you so much for your time bevav and to all the other panelists abhishek uh, kanishka thank you so much uh, we'll t- we'll have time for maybe one or two questions before we uh, we wind up this webinar thank you so much good evening everyone uh, so uh, this my questions and there are 14 uh i mean i'll just throw the questions you can just whoever is one kind of going to try and club uh, which is essentially with regard to data being collected by the government whether it fir a police complaint uh, any other data being collected question that is being asked by several people within the uh, within the you know uh, the people uh, who joined today is how will that data be treated and will that be governed by the the privacy bill and 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 how how one needs to uh, will it be a breach of uh, data if somebody uh, sees some information in the fir and then then then, then uh, discloses it how will that be de- dealt with so you know beva vrishi whoever wants to take that sorry anil uh, i i was not able to hear the question i did hear the fir part of it i had gotten disconnected okay uh, so i'll i'll ask again uh, it's essentially a, a group of uh, uh, you know of our of our uh, participants today have been asking the impact of uh you know so the government collects a lot of data whether it's as a part of a police complaint whether it's a part of a consumer complaint fir uh what is the status of that data for the the bill and and will information provided as a part of that uh if that is shared with the third party will that be considered a data breach i think that's the broad context of the uh, at least three or four different questions that we can see out here understood uh so i th- think uh, let me take it um, uh, uh, when it comes to even government i think the bill does apply there are certain exemptions provided so for organizations uh, just to give you an example if if there is a legal obligation or the order of a court then processing of that personal data disclosure of that personal data would be exempted now while as as we have discussed uh, in the last one hour about the simplification of the bill there are aspects which are not covered but at, from a privacy principle perspective what i would expect is disclosure where necessary uh an avoidance of unnecessary disclosure would be uh the principle that would be applicable and should be applicable uh for the private uh, in the, uh, the industry um, or any individual or even the government processing data uh while consent etc may be exempted uh, you would see that one of the changes that are there in the bill is 
the security aspect uh, or the obligations having been mandated irrespective of irrespective of any exemptions being granted so i i would assume that when we see the rules coming forth uh, there would be there would be obligations on uh, or protection from unnecessary uh, accidental disclosure even on government processing um, the examples that you just cited right and and uh, for the for the purposes of uh, the, the 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 entire audience uh, at this moment there are a number of uh, sections of the bill where it's mentioned uh, that it will be eventually pre as prescribed by the government so there are several places where we don't know exactly how this will pan out uh, so we'll probably have to wait a little more to have a clear answer to some of these questions but i found one question uh, of particular interest uh, and rishi if you want to take that uh, do data fiduciaries have the option to refuse service if data principle refuses consent so uh, this is something that i think most businesses are are worried about so if you want to take that please um we cannot you rishi you have to unmute yourself you are, you are on mute oh sorry 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 so i think yeah means the pdp bill 2019 as well as the current bill both had this provision wherein the data uh, fiduciaries have the option to you know in in a way not to provide the services in case the consent is refused or maybe withdrawn so i think in the current bill they have mentioned that you know that the consequences of not providing the consent or withdrawal of consent has to be borne by the data principle so i think the bill is quite clear as to you know what happens once you know this consent is refused or withdrawn sure uh, the next question is with regard to uh, whether a seller and a buyer relationship uh, will be covered under deemed consent so by virtue of you uh, buying something uh, uh, whatever data is sought from you would it be assumed that uh, you, there is a deemed consent for all of that either of you if you want to just take that so uh, uh, i'll take it uh... When it comes to now, they have introduced the um, concept of deemed consent. Now, if you see the first sub clause within deemed consent, it has this reasonable expectation uh, clause, uh, which may cover it. And there's an illustration to state it. But uh, when it comes to it, it it's very factual, uh, and you'll have to put it in context. If you see the less illustration, maybe when I'm booking a table at a restaurant, I need to give my number for them to call me, um, etc. But if I'm buying a uh, uh clothing item from a shop uh data may not be necessary so consent may be the basis of it so i think that's how we'll have to uh, balance it out there is no specific either uh, and in most of the occasions where a buyer and seller relationship exists now one of the concerns i've raised with the current bill is the lack of contractual performance or obligate uh, contractual performance as being part of the deemed consent or other grounds of processing uh that is not carved out but in the consumer context if there is reasonable expectation or need uh, to process the data for that service or that buying, maybe uh, a law requires that if you buy purchase a gun, you need to give personal details before you take a license. Maybe that's where personal data would be allowed to be processed. But somewhere where I'm buying a clothing item at Adidas, I should have the option to say no because the only purpose for them taking my data is to directly market to me or remarket to me at a later date. So I think those contextual interpretation will have to be made in a case to case scenario. And therefore, right. that humongous and onerous task of evaluating every data processing activity comes about in terms of con compliance, which Rishi has talked about earlier. Right. And, and if I can just add to what you just said, Bibav, so the example that you gave about giving your telephone number for booking a table. Now, by giving your telephone number, you have been you have deemed given deemed consent for the purposes of booking. But if now that number is shared with three other agencies who then call you for insurance, that would not be covered under de uh, de uh, deemed consent. So deemed consent will also have to be measured against the purpose for which you are giving that information. And I think that's something that we need to keep in mind. Uh, the next question is data of vendors, customers are being collected by the companies for due diligence perspective. Uh, would that data which is being collected by companies uh, for due diligence, would that be covered under the privacy bill? Rishi, if you want to, or we are we are fine with either of you taking that. So it has not been clearly, you know, kind of uh, panned out in the bill. But yeah, you know, the legitimate business purpose is a is an umbrella term which I believe would cover, you know, this aspect as well. Uh, you know, all all kind of uh, you know due diligences, even if it is for uh, a 
proposed merger or acquisition or you know before getting into a, a transaction with a third party so yeah means uh, if it is legitimate if it is serving a legitimate uh, legitimate business purpose then yeah it, it is covered very much covered right so um, I, mean, I have a bit of a concern on this uh, or uh, at least a contribute to a certain extent i know that the intention is to allow processing of such sort uh, but uh, one of the concerns is that uh, most of these would arise on contractual obligations, due diligence, et cetera, with customers, et cetera. Mm, that, and therefore, having a specific clause, as Vishy mentioned, it, there's nothing mentioned in it, is somewhat of a con concern, and it should be included mm, by the government. Uh, because currently, the reasonable purpose is something that will be defined subsequently, It's I think, as an as prescribed clause. it's uh, It does also have a sub uh, parameter or determining factor of public interest right. and when it comes to customers showing public interest is a little difficult so therefore uh, it becomes a little gray in, as Rishi rightly pointed out hence a concern that they need to capture this contractual obligation data processing as part of deemed consent sure uh, moving on, and we'll just probably to be, have time for one or two more questions. Will the implementation of the act impact the private organization to upgrade their data security system? I guess the question is, as a result of this, will you have to upgrade your data security system? It's, I think, uh, the minimum. I think one of the things that is the most important that I think uh, is required for any organization is data protection. While And then the bill does talk about personal data protection. Security is one of the most important part for any organization. I think uh, while there is processing, consent, notice, as long as you have good information security practices, uh, I think you will have lesser of data breaches, unlawful access, and reduction in liability. I think that uh, privacy compliance on terms of consent, lawful ground is an important part, but information security takes away 80% of the risk if you really have those practices in place. And we'll just take this last question and I'll ask this question because it's a pretty interesting, broad question to end with. Uh, and it's come from uh, Mr. Krishanan K. Uh, will the proposed bill pass the adequacy tests under the GDPR? Uh, so, uh, uh, I mean, I know that there is no yes or no answer to that, and that's why we'll end with this. So, uh, Rishi, maybe you first, and then Bibhav, and then we'll uh, we'll wind up for today, and then we'll come back once uh, the the government comes back with the next version of the bill. But uh, do you think the current version passes the adequacy test under the GDPR? Uh, not sure, because uh, you know, as I mentioned, a lot of the law is yet to be notified in the form of rules and regulations, standards and codes, which are going to be issued by the Data Protection Board. So it remains, you know, that the, the final nuances remains to be seen. So we will see that, you know, whether that adequacy provision, you know, we are the bill is uh, able to address or not. So, so I will means uh, that I'll give a benefit of doubt, something like that. So yeah, means. Uh, uh, maybe the bill indicating towards that, but then whether it will pass or not, that remains to be seen. I think um, in the current form, I completely agree. I, I'm not an expert. I'm not really engaged in um, or have studied extensively on how these adequacy uh, decisions are make, made. But from public domain uh, expertise, uh, sorry, uh, public domain knowledge, uh, what I understand is that it is there is a political angle to it there is a lot of other factors that come into play now what i believe is that while it may not be in the pristine form that you would want in uh but if no rules are there which help broaden or at least um, get those clarity that uh, is expected in the adequacy provision or expectation under gdpr uh, one of the things that we need to be a little conscious of is that india is a very important market um, and that makes it, that gives me some optimism that uh, there would be a possibility they would not exclude India from the adequacy decision if India does attempt to, while India will have to make strides in terms of changes, etc. Uh, in the bill. But uh, uh, to be very honest, uh, I am not too clear right now at this stage, uh, but very optimistic that it, it would be included with this uh, uh, bill coming forth. Right. I, I, I mean, uh, and, and, uh, we will end with this. Uh, if, if, if my personal view is that, yes, at this moment, 
it is a bill in the right direction from the point of view of trying to be considered as adequate from the GDPR perspective. Uh, once the you know all the T's are crossed and I's are dotted, uh, once the uh, next version of the bill with the comments. Uh, come out, we'll probably have a much better understanding of uh, whether we have passed the adequacy test or not. Uh, I know we have not been able to answer all the questions that were uh, that were asked. We will definitely respond to all of them over the next few days. I know a lot of people have wanted to know whether the recording will be shared. The answer is yes, it will be. Uh, we will share it in, uh, you know, in the, on our YouTube channel as well as our website. And we'll be able to get, a, uh, get to see that there. Uh, we want to thank all of you for the time that you've spared this afternoon with all of us. Uh, hope you found this uh, session enlightening. Thank you very much for the time. Thank you, Rishi. Thank you, uh, Viva. Thank you, Kanishma. Once again, uh, we'll see you for the next session. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Team explosion. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.